Hey, my name is JP or, or Jonathan Bacluda. I get the honor, have the honor and the privilege to uh, serve with the young adults here on staff at Watermark. And I am uh, the husband to my bride, Monica Pacluda, who is the queen of our house. And then we have two princesses, uh, little Presley Kate and uh, Finley Noel, who are Presley's three and Finley is one. And uh, they were not on that video, but they certainly could have been. But the reason I love that video, you know, and I know it's, it's uh, kids and that may not be the most relevant image to us, but it really is because like not a lot changes. I mean, it re- I mean, seriously, and I'm not talking about marshmallows, but isn't that how, you know, how this whole thing evolves, right? We, we see something that we're not supposed to do. We have clear instructions. Hey, don't do this. And, and there will be life. There will be a, a reward. You know, you'll get two if you just don't eat this one. If you stay away from this thing, I got something better for you. And, and then we're kind of, but we're just looking at that thing and we're trying not to look at it and we're looking back and then we're smelling it and maybe we're licking it and maybe we're tasting it or, or maybe you're like me and that, that sweet little redhead a girl that's just chomping down on it before, before the test even starts, because that's how, that's how I have rolled in the past. And, um, and, and so today we are talking about the birthplace of sin, okay? The birth of sin, uh, which you may know as temptation, Okay, so today we are talking about temptation. We are continuing our series in James, and I hope you would bring your Bible, and I hope you bring a pen, and I hope you bring a friend, because here's the deal. Here's the exciting thing, uh, or what I'm excited about this series, is we're going to go through this. We're not doing like one chapter a week, and I'm sorry if, if I um, made you guys believe that. We're going verse by verse through James. And, and so if you bring your Bible, and you make notes, or you go back and you listen to this online, and if you missed one, go back and listen to it, you will know an entire book of the Bible verse by verse. And we're going to specifically take this and run this through the lens of a, of a Dallas 20 something or 30 something and apply it to our lives. So you will be able to counsel your friends out of scripture. You can go back and study this book in your community group, but we are going to go through this book verse by verse until we cover all five chapters. And, um, and, and when we are done, you will know, right? You will know and understand a book of the Bible. If you've been tracking with us every single week. I want to talk about today, as I said, the temptation or the birthplace of sin. And uh, today you're going to learn some, a really difficult theological truth. It's a very lofty, very difficult uh, theological truth, but it is extremely, extremely practical to apply to your lives when you understand what this text is saying, because it says some things that can be rather confusing, and, and we really have to study this passage to understand what God is telling, to, telling us through James and, and how to apply this to our lives. And so I want to, before we even get started today, I just want to define temptation for us, and then I want to look at where it comes from, okay, the source of temptation, and then I want to look at what it leads to, what temptation leads to. And before we leave here tonight, as we go back into Dallas, back to our works, back to our relationships, back to our friends, back to our community groups, I want to look at how we can uh, have victory over this thing that we know as temptation. Just really practice what, what we see in these texts, the next verses that we're going to look at, specifically James chapter 1, verses 13 through 18. That's where we're going to be. So let me start off by defining temptation for you. Okay? Temptation is mentally acknowledging options to choose sin or to choose to believe that Christ is better than the alternative. Okay, so temptation is something that you do when you mentally acknowledge your options, your options to either sin, okay, or pursue that which God tells you will bring death, or to pursue Christ, believe that Christ has something better for you, to pursue that which God tells us will bring life. But here's the deal, here's the challenging part about this text. There are two types of temptations in Scripture. There are external temptations and internal temptations. That is key to understanding this text and some of the very difficult theological questions that come out of this text. There is an external temptation. We know that as a trial. That is what we discussed last week, if you were here. Those things, those things that we fall uh, into, the text says, that literally the Greek there means that you fall into, like when, you, uh, like when we see that in the Gospels, where someone falls into a situation with robbers and they're beaten by them. So Something situational or circumstantial where you lose your job, someone breaks up with you, um, you get sick, you get in a car accident, you find yourself in these trials or these situations, these external temptations, we'll call those. 
Today we're going to talk about internal temptations. That is when you explore your options. That is when you're in a situation and you have choices of what you're going to do and you're thinking that over and you have an option to pursue Christ or to believe that Christ has something better for you or to pursue sin, that which God tells us will bring life but, but sometimes we don't trust him or we don't believe him and so we pursue that. Let me, let me explain to you what I mean. Okay. Um, say that you find yourself your guy, let's say, hypothetically. And you find yourself in a situation where um, there's a really hot girl there. And you're kind of competing for her attention amongst all these other guys. Right? All these guys are trying to compete for her attention. Let's say, hypothetically, there's a camera on you too. Maybe you're on a TV show. And you decide that in order to get her attention, you're going to get a tattoo. All right? Maybe on your wrist. Maybe of a heart and a shield and maybe a rose. See, what happened is your situation was an external trial. You're in this position where you could choose to sin or not to sin. And then you're like, man, I really want to get her attention. So I'm going to do something really stupid like get a tattoo and freak her out. All right, that's what's going to go down. Let's just say hypothetically. All right? Or, or maybe more practical to us. Um, you're in a situation, like you're in a place... And you're a guy, we'll run with that. And, uh, and then a, a girl walks by, right? Maybe she's in a low-cut shirt or she's wearing kind of something scantily clad. Okay, so this is an external trial. This isn't anything that you've done. You haven't sinned in this moment. You're just sitting there, right? And, and, and then all of a sudden you have a choice, right? You can um, think terrible thoughts about her. Right? You can get up, you can go and, and pursue a relationship with her, someone you don't know, which is just absolutely weird, guys. I don't know why you do that at the porch when you go up to someone and, and you don't know them. That's strange. But, I mean, there's lots of girls that you know here. Ask those girls out, not someone you don't know. Um, I'm not angry. Uh, <laughs> And so there's a girl there. You can pursue her. You can do all these things, right? Or you can choose, right, to look away and to focus on the things of God and to not give yourself mentally to her, right? Okay, or, or girls, um, you're in the mall, you're shopping, morally neutral, nothing wrong with this. You're there, you uh, see a purse, maybe in the coach store, right? And maybe you know you can't afford this purse, okay? So it should be maybe over right there, but then you start thinking, you're like, well, that really matches those shoes that I got, and that would look great if I could have that purse, and you know, I got that credit card, and I've been doing such a great job at paying that down, I think I deserve that purse. And then all of a sudden, you have justified, right, and now temptation, internal temptation has happened. There was an external struggle, morally neutral, there's a purse that you can't afford, it's, it's there. You, you're in this, an external uh, trial, it has nothing to do with you. It is outside of your body. What happened then, you were faced with a choice. And that is where the temptation that we're talking today comes into place. Here's why this is important. Because in, this, in the first chapter of James, we see the Greek word parazo to describe both types of temptations. Okay, The ones we talked about last week, the external trials. And then the ones we're going to talk about this week, the internal struggles or internal temptations. The Greek word there is the same. The way that we differentiate those is by our context clues. The way that we see those things uh, used in different ways in Scripture. And I'll explain this just under my first point. But that is so there's two sorts of temptations. There's an external struggle and there's an internal struggle or an internal temptation. That which we're going to talk about today. Can the external struggle turn into the internal struggle? Absolutely, as with those situations that I just explained. All right, let's dive in. Verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desires, he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. Okay, my first point tonight is the birthplace of temptation. What is the birthplace of temptation? We're going to be looking at um, verses 13 through 18. 
I'm sorry, I just said that, but verses 13 through 14. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. Okay, first, first idea, right? Temptation is not from God. God does not tempt us. All right, now here's the problem with that. See, I believe that God is completely sovereign over all things. And that everything that happens to you happens under his sovereignty. All right, but the text says that he can't tempt you. And so this can be theologically confusing. Right? Because here's, here's what it's saying. God will not tempt you the internal struggle. He will not persuade you to sin. He will not say, hey, you see that purse over there? You should buy it. I know you can't afford it. Don't worry about it. Just go buy it. He won't say, hey, you see that girl over there? Dude, you should give yourself to her. If not now, later, just go ask her out. Whatever that is, ask for a number. You know, I know you don't know her. I know she's probably not a believer. She's probably no good for you, but, but go ahead. God won't do that. This is what this text is saying. God does not tempt you. He does not push you towards an internal struggle. Does God present you with options? Does God put you through trials? Does he test you? Absolutely, he does. That's what we looked at last week. I know a lot of us, we, we don't understand, or, or coming in here tonight, we haven't understand, stood the difference there. But the difference is very important in understanding this text. God does not tempt us. Does he put us through trials? Absolutely. What about Job, right? Did, did, did God in his sovereignty allow Satan to strip Job of just about everything? Yes, he did. Okay, what about this? Here's a really tricky one. It says God does not tempt us. And so we look at the original sin, the the fall, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden, right? God says, hey, don't eat from this tree. But he put the tree there. God, in his sovereignty, he placed the tree there. Was the tree the source of temptation? Eventually, that's what happened, right? God said, hey, don't touch this. But see, God is a loving father. Listen to this part. God is a loving dad. He is a loving father. And so he gives us rules. He says, hey, don't eat from this. If you eat from this, there will be death. It's here. It could tempt you. Don't entertain that thought. Okay? Don't acknowledge that option. I'm telling you, don't do this. If you do this, there will be death. So God can allow us to go through the external trial, the situations, right? Because in God's sovereignty, did that girl walk by in front of you with wearing that low-cut blouse? Absolutely she did. Under God's sovereignty, was that person in the coach store at North Park Mall? Absolutely it was. Absolutely. God allowed that purse to be there. God allowed her to walk by. But did God come to your mind and say, hey, you should buy that purse? Hey, you should look at that girl. No. No, only the father of lies would do that. Right? Only the father of lies would do that. And so here's what you say. This is the thing I always run into. Love this question. So, why would I have these desires... If God doesn't want me to pursue them, why would God given me? Why would God have given me these desires if He didn't want me to do this? Like clearly, right? Like I'm all worked up and I got this fire burning inside of me. Like clearly, God wants me to do this. It's a natural thing, right? Pornography, masturbation, sex before marriage. Like God's given me this desire. I think I'm supposed to do this, right? Let me tell you how ridiculous that argument is. How ridiculous that argument is. Let me tell you something. My, um, I, I told you, Presley and Finley, right? Um, you, you get to see their maturity because there's about two years apart in age. And so with Finley, my one-year-old, I have to, when she's sitting down at the table, I have to keep everything away from her. Like if anything is in reach that can be splattered, spilled, or thrown across the room, it will be. And so if there's like a cup, a, a cup of Coke or a glass of water or whatever, like she will grab it and spill it. Like that's just what she's going to do. That's how she rolls. Okay, Presley used to do that. She used to do that, but see, as Presley grew and matured, we, we would tell her, hey, Presley, you can't do that. Like, don't, don't grab the cup. No, you need to drink from it. We're trying to teach her table manners, right? The other day, we're at, at Mr. Gaddy's, though, right? And so there's, there's Finley, and she has everything, like, without of arm's reach from her. And there's Presley. And every now and then, and, and I'm trying to teach her, like, not to put her hands in her drink, you know? And so there her drink is, like, right, right in front of her. She'll, like, go in for th- some ice, or she'll go in mine, which is even more gross. Um, and, and there she is. And she kind of, she sticks her hand in her, her drink and she stops. Just like those kids kind of eating those marshmallows. She stops and she thinks. And I see the internal struggle. Like she knows she's not supposed to do that. And then she kind of looks at me and then she kind of smirks. And, and I'm just watching. I'm just watching. Why? Because a loving daddy tests their kids. And I want to see what she's going to do. 
and she pulls her hand back. Why do I do that? Because I don't want Presley to be like on a date when she's 18, uh, I mean 35, and um, <laughs> right, and I don't want her, I don't want her to like be like, hey, you know, and just, I don't want her doing that. I want her to mature. I want to teach her, right? And worse, hey, worse than that, less, much less funny than that, even difficult for me to say, I don't want some guy, right, like wanting to uh, proposition her for sex and her being like, well, daddy sent me on the date. Clearly he doesn't care. Because see, here's what Presley could have done. She could have been like, hey, daddy, if you didn't want me to do this, you wouldn't have said it there. If you didn't want me to do this, if you didn't want me to get my eyes, if you didn't want me to spill this drink, you wouldn't have said it there. This is your fault. Isn't that what we do with God? Well, God wouldn't have given me the des- these desires. That you, you're tempting me. No. No, I'm not. I'm testing you. I'm, I'm expecting you to grow and mature. I'm expecting you to be able to handle those desires inside of you. I'm expecting you to be able to grow to a point where you can fight them appropriately and, and put them in the place that they belong. I'm expecting you to choose me. I'm expecting you in that moment to remember how I've trained you, to remember my rules and my commands because that's what a loving father does. And so I don't want her to be on that date one day and being like, well, daddy sent me on this date, so clearly he doesn't care what I do. No, Presley, you've got to learn, right, where your boundaries are for yourself and to choose to honor your father, not this father, but that father. A loving parent tests their kid. It's like when we're playing in the front yard and the ball rolls out in the street and I'll make sure her car's not coming, but I'll watch her. I'll watch her, and the first couple times she'll run out after it. I'll grab her, I'll sit her in the grass, and I'll say, Presley, when the ball rolls in the street, you need to come and get your daddy. You need to come and tell me. Right? And, and then the ball rolls out in the street again, and I'll say, hey, Presley, what are you going to do? She'll look at me, and then she darts after the ball. She grabs it, and I sit her down in the grass. say, Presley, when the ball rolls out in the street, you need to come and get your daddy. Right, So that one day, right, when that ball rolls out in the street and there's a truck flying by, she's going to come and get me. She's not going to run to her death. Hey, Adam and Eve, don't eat from the tree. Hey, friends, don't give yourself to drunkenness. Hey, friends, don't give yourself to premarital sex. Hey, don't entertain pornography. Don't entertain sexual or lustful desires. Hey, friends, don't go into debt. Don't buy things you can't afford. Live in community. Walk in the light. Obey my commands because I love you and I am your perfect father in heaven. And I love you. And I know better than this world knows. I know better than this city knows. And I love you. And I've got something better for you. Better than two marshmallows. Something better. The text says that God cannot be tempted. But here's the tricky thing with that. God was tempted. We see that in all three of the synoptic gospels, which just means the, the, um, the first three gospels, the gospels in St. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay? We see that Jesus was tempted. He was taken to the top of the hill. He was shown the city by Satan. It, the text says very uh, plainly there he was tempted. It says three times in Hebrews that he was tempted. It says it in Mar- Matthew 4, Mark 1, and Luke 4 where this ha- happened. So Jesus was put through an external trial. But Jesus did not mentally entertain his options. He didn't sit there and say, oh, wait, what? I can have all this? This can be my city? These can be my people? I can roll over them? What? I can live in that big house, drive that nice car or that camel or whatever? I I can do that? I can do that? Really? No, he didn't do that. He was like, no, man, I don't, I don't, Satan, get behind me. Get away from me. I don't want anything to do with you. So he was tempted, but he was not tempted. Do we see the difference? External temptation, external trial, internal trial, internal struggle. Okay, so Jesus was externally tempted. He was externally tried, but he did not entertain his options mentally. Jesus is our example. Hebrews 4 says, um, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but he... I'm sorry, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he was without sin. So he was tempted, but he did not sin. He did not entertain his options. And so where does this desire come from? Where does temptation come from? How does this happen, right? The text says,
But each one is tempted when, by his own evil desire, he is dragged away and enticed. So whose responsibility is your sin? It's yours. It's not Satan's. It's not your mommy's or your daddy's. It's not your parents. It's not your upbringing. It's not your terrible boss or your broken relationship or your abusive boyfriend or your terrible girlfriend. It is your problem. It is your responsibility. It is yours to deal with, yours to fight, yours to find victory of. It says that our temptation comes from our own evil desires. Romans says there's nothing good in you He says there's nothing good in you, right? Our own evil desires want everything that is bad for us, everything that is wrong for us, everything that is attracted to us, attracted to us in this world, right? The the text there, the specific Greek that he uses describes like a fish hook or a trap, like a a trap with some bait in it, where you're attracted to the bait, but the bait has a hook in it or it has a snare that's going to capture you. And it says, hey, don't be lured. See, no fish is going to bite a a bait when it knows it's plastic and it has a hook in it that's going to pull us to its death. But don't we? Like, don't we pursue that sometimes, which we know is wrong for us. We know the hook is there. The, The text is clear. The Bible's clear. Hey, that's a trap. And we still pursue it. We still want it. We still go after it. We still look at it, smell it, taste it, see if, make sure no one's looking still the same thing for young adults as it is for little Presley and, and Finley. So what happens? So what comes next? Verse 5. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers. Here's some weird ver- verbiage that James is using. He's, he's talking about like conception and, and like a, a child growing and, and giving birth. That's, that's the, the Greek, that's the specific words that he's using. A very vivid imagery of this thing being born. Okay, I'll read it again. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Do not be deceived, my dear brothers. And so this is my second point tonight, the life cycle of temptation. And this is the life cycle of temptation. We are presented with options, right? We can look at the girl, we can look away, we can buy the purse, or we can walk on. We are presented with options, okay? Temptation is the presentation of the lie. Temptation is, hey, there's life in that girl. There's life in that purse. There's life in buying that thing. There's life in watching that show that's no good for you, but your wife made you watch it. There's, oh, that's me. Um, there's life. There's life in those things. That's the lie. The temptation is the presentation of the lie. And so then what happens, right? We're presented with options and then we entertain the option that does not honor God. It's like, well, I wonder, wonder what it would be like if I wonder if I talk to that girl, I wonder what I'd say. I wonder what really cool keen pickup line I'd use. I wonder what would happen there. I, I wonder, so that purse would look, would look really good with those shoes though, seriously. And, and if I bought it, then maybe I would get his attention and then maybe I would have that need within me fulfilled Right, I I really think that is what would complete me. That's the presentation of the lie. Right? And now we've started to entertain the lie. We started to entertain the lie mentally. We're exploring our options. And eventually that thought turns into action, right? Eventually it will turn into action. If you continue to entertain the thought, you are going to act on it. Eventually. Whether later or in the moment, you're going to buy it, you're going to wish you bought it, you're going to buy something else, you're going to ask her for a number, or you're going to find her on Facebook, and and just whatever, it's going to happen. Something's going to happen. When you entertain the thought, it's going to happen. The sin is going to follow. And then sin grows to death. Addiction. I went home, I saw the girl, I went home, I looked at porn. Now I can't stop looking at porn. I'm addicted to porn. I'm trying to shake this thing. I'm trying to fight this thing. Now I love porn more than I love God. I bought the purse. I went into debt. I can't pay off the credit card. Now I've got two credit cards. Now half my paycheck is going to my credit cards. Death has occurred. I watched the show, 
right? It, it fed my mind full of crap that I'm supposed to love because I live in this city. I love that stuff. I get jealous of my friends when they get to do that stuff and death is occurring in my life. I thought Christianity was about finding life. John 10, 10, he said, I've come so that you may have life and have it abundantly. And I'm sitting here and I'm dying. And God, it's your fault because you tempted me. Brings death. Wash, rinse, and repeat. That's the cycle. Starts with the thought, the temptation. You entertain it. You sin. Sin comes death. Thought, temptation, entertain it. Sin, death. Wash, rinse, repeat. Until you fight it. Until you wage war. Until you find something better. That's what happens. I'll show you what it looks like in Dallas. First Timothy, first Timothy six nine. People who want, okay, there's the desire. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap. There's the bait or the sin, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. There's the death. We've got the conception, sin is birthed, then comes death, all in one verse. Very prominent here in Dallas. And so is there any hope? Here we are, we're struggling. Like, JP, man, give me some hope, right? How, how, do, we, how do we fight this thing? How do we beat this thing? Where do we go in this struggle, man? I'm fighting. I don't, know how to, I don't know how to shake this. I've been doing the right things. I told my community group, I've been praying, bro, but I don't know what to do. I still want the purse. I still want the girl. Whatever your struggle is, yes, there's hope. Verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He is constant. He is the Father, the one who hung the heavenly lights, who hung the stars, put them in place. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. It says, God does not change. Second Corinthians eleven fourteen says, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Satan can only take the things of God and twist them. He can only take holy things or morally neutral things, take them out of their place where they should be, okay, and say, hey, you should pursue those things for the wrong reasons. He can only twist that which is good so that destruction will come. That's his trick. He's been doing it since the garden. Hey, there's life there. You can be like God. Just eat it. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Just do it. That's his game, man. It's his only game. He's been doing it since the garden. All right, but God does not change. So what? Here's my last question, my third and final point. Who is your daddy? Who's your daddy? The answer to that question changes everything. Who is your daddy? God does not change. So here we are. We're faced with this temptation. We're sitting in a situation. We got options. We're lost in our options. God, what do we do with our options? It's like when the people, like in the early days, right, when they would travel. This is before like GPS systems and navigation systems. When they got lost, they would look for fixed points. It's funny that this text says the father of the heavenly lights, specifically talking about the stars, but they would look for fixed points like the North Star. That would tell them where true north is. And so when they're lost, they're looking for that fixed point. And so they they don't know where to go. They don't know where they're at. And then there it is. And focus, focus, focus. Okay. All right. That's what I'm going to do. That's where I'm going to go. God doesn't change. The North Star is constant. And so when you're lost in your options, you focus on that which is constant. God, what would you have me do? The proverbial, what would Jesus do? WWJD, whatever works for you, man. Wear the bracelet if you want. I don't care. But here's the deal. You find the constant and you pursue it. That's how you beat temptation. I've got options. God, what would honor you? Who is your daddy? The text says that we are his children. He is our heavenly father, right? He protects us from balls that roll in the street. He protects us from all sorts of things, embarrassing ourselves on dates. He protects us from these things. He loves us. John 3, 9 says, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot go on sinning because he has been what? Born of God. 
We are his children. John, 1 John 5, 4. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. 1 John 5, 18. We know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who, has, who was born of God keeps him safe. And the evil one cannot harm him. See, we know that we are children of God when we walk in obedience, when we obey his commands. Obedience is that which marks those who are born of God. And he is our perfect and sovereign dad. And whenever faced with temptation, check this out. This is a promise from scripture. Listen to me. Test this, try this, tell me this is true. This is proof of faith, man. Whenever faced with temptation, God will provide you a way out. Every time. That's what this means. Oh, here's what this means. You will never have to sin. You will never, for the rest of your life, be placed in a situation where your only option is sin. You will always have a way out. You will always be propositioned with something that is righteous. You will always have an option, better said, uh, of to choose something that is righteous, that brings glory to God. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Here's what you say. You say, I can't beat this thing. I can't shake this thing. You're lying. The text says otherwise. It says he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. It won't happen. And he says, when you are tempted, he will provide a way out that you can stand up under. Tell me, those with pornography addictions in the room, that you haven't gone to look at pornography and your internet doesn't work for some unexplained reason. Tell me it hadn't happened, because it's happened to me. It has happened to me many a times. And and other things, right? Other things. I I had an addiction to energy drinks, and, and one time I just felt the Spirit of God telling me, hey, don't do it, don't do it. And I went in there, I fed the machine my, my money. It just happened the other day, if I'm honest. I pushed the, the button, <laughs> nothing came out. Nothing. All right, way out. First Corinthians 10, 13. It happens. God is real. He's alive. He's your Father in heaven, and He loves you. And He loves you. We are to avoid temptation, right? We don't want to go where temptation, Jesus prayed, Father, lead me not into temptation or lead us not into temptation. People, I, I hate this when, when guys say, hey, the porch is temptation because there's all these pretty girls there. What does that mean? Do you lock yourself in your closet? Like you don't go to the swimming pool or the lake or North Park or, or out to eat in Dallas? I hate when guys say that. That's just a personal pet peeve. I'm sorry for going off on that. Um, you are to trust in the life that God has for you, right? The two marshmallows, the things to come, the blessings, those things that God has promised, his inheritance, right? You are to trust that God is your father and he has something better. You are to trust and obey, trust and obey, trust and obey. Obedience comes easier as you trust God. Let me tell you what I mean, right? We're at um, Great Wolf Lodge this past weekend. Great Wolf Lodge is like this big indoor water park. I've got my two girls there. Um, it's a lot of fun, right? And so they, like Presley, she's three, and she's just having a blast in a little splash pool, and I'm like just kind of drooling at the big water slide. I'm like, hey, Presley, let's go do it. You know, you and me, come on. And she's like, no, Daddy, no. And I'm like, hey, you can trust me. You can trust me. I'm your dad. I wouldn't do anything to harm you. Let's go on the water slide. You know, I know you can't swim, but I got you. And so... Uh, uh, and, and so we go, we, she, I talk her into it, like basically that means I drug her up the four, 14 flights of stairs, and, and we get in the tube... Like, there we are, and she's scared. And she's scared, and I just, I, I trust her, you can trust her. I'm right here, I got you. I'm not going to let anything happen. And we go down the water slide. She's scared the whole time, but when we get to the bottom, she's just like, smile, ear to ear. And I'm like, you did it. You did it. She jumps off the tube. She goes and tells mommy. She's like, mommy, I just went down the water slide. Mommy's like, was it fun? She's like, I was scared, but it was fun. I, I, it was so much fun. I'm like, Presley, I want to give you life. I don't want to rip you off. I want to give you life. I want to lead you to things that where life is, right? I want you to do this. And so then she was able to later go down a water slide by herself and she had so much fun because she trusted me. Here's the deal though. Check this out. Let me, let me say something really important here. What if we would have went down that slide? What if something terrible would have happened? Like what if we would have got flipped over? What if she, you know, she would have choked on some water, water went up her nose when we landed? What, what if something like that would have happened, right? Is the water slide bad? Was I, did I lie? No. 
The water slide is still good. She can still trust me. Sometimes things don't go great, right? God says, hey, do that. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes you go and you speak truth to someone and they lash out at you. Sometimes it happens. Sometimes you are faced with temptation. You choose what, you, what is right, right? Like everybody wants to buy this thing and you know you shouldn't buy it and everybody buys it and everybody gets rich except you. Sometimes it happens. But obedience, right, is not always associated with the outcome. Obedience is obedience. You obey. You trust and obey because God loves you. I'll give you another example from this weekend when we're there. There's this thing in a swimming pool. And it's got these like floating lily pads and this little rope over it where you can kind of like balance yourself on the lily pads over the swimming pool and walk across. And um, and Presley like was just enamored. She didn't want to go over the big water slides because they're big and intimidating, but that she wanted to do. Here's the problem with that. It's five feet deep. She's three feet tall. She can't swim. I'm like, Presley, you can't do that. She's like, Daddy, I want to. She says, Daddy, look how much fun they're having. Everybody's laughing over there, Daddy. Daddy, let me do that. Why can't you let me do that? Daddy, I want to do that. That's worth fun. Why do you got to be so mean to me, Daddy? Presley, you can trust me. I love you. And if you do that, you're going to get hurt. There's death there. See that water slide? There's life there. I got you. There's death there. See, you can't swim and you will fall. And when you do fall, you will drown. And you will get hurt. There's death there. I'm your daddy and you can trust me. Man, this text is real. It applies to our life. I should in there, but I'm not going to go one more step, okay? There's not a moment of your life till the day you die that you're not faced with temptation. You can always sin. When you leave this place, you will be faced with temptation. Right now, in your thoughts, you are faced with temptation. You will always have an option to sin, right? Christ is our example. When faced with temptation straight from Satan, right there in his presence, he chose not to sin. He said, I will not entertain that option. He was obedient all the way to the cross. That which sets us free. You will always be faced with temptation. That doesn't go away. But you don't have to choose sin. You don't have to. All right. In summary, in closing, I want to remind you that temptation comes from our own desires. And temptation leads to sin, and sin leads to death every time. And we can overcome temptation by looking to our Father for guidance. And so here's the deal. This is what spiritual growth looks like. You're faced with options. And you're sitting there, right? And and when you're really, really green, or or maybe you're not even a believer, or maybe you just become a believer, right? You explore those bad options. You go, it's it's like when you're in a maze, right? And so you're in a maze, and you're like constantly bumping your head up against walls. Like you go down this one, boom, wall, break up. Down this one, boom, hangover. You go down this one, boom, she's pregnant. You're pregnant, or whatever that is. Right? Boom, STD. Boom, layoff. You're in this maze. And you're constantly choosing wrong because you're entertaining those options. And when you entertain those options, it leads to sin. And sin leads, brings death. And, and you're constantly bringing forth death in your life. But when you grow spiritually and you begin to trust your Father in heaven, and when you're faced with those options, you look at that constant And you say, all right, how do I get out of this? And he says, hey, this is my will. This is what you should do. Okay, that's what I'm going to do. And all of a sudden, so the first one, right? The first one, boom, boom, boom. It looks like this. Right? That's the maze. It's all complicated and stuff. You're looking at your life and you're like, man, I don't know which way to go. What is God's will? What should I do? I don't know. Like, should I go out with him because I really want to go out with him? Should I buy that purse because it really matches my shoes? Should I look at that girl because she's really hot? I don't know. What should I do? But then all of a sudden we start trusting God, right? And it gets easier. And the options become less because we're there and we're like, man, I'm not going to do that. I did that last time and I remember where that led to me. And it starts to look like this. It starts to get easier and more simple, right? The maze simplifies a little bit. All right, I think this is, I'm pretty sure, I remember last time and I remember what my community group said and they said, hey, this is the way to go. I remember that verse the other day JP said about, said at the porch and so I think this is what I should do here. I don't think I should go out this Friday night with those guys. I know that every time I go out with those guys, I regret it. And it starts to get easier, 
And then all of a sudden you get to this place where it gets really simple. And it's like, hey, God. Even I can do that one, right? It's like, hey, God, what would you have me do? Man, I'm not going to look at that girl. It's not even worth it. I've been down that road. I know the death that, the, the guilt that I feel right after I do something stupid. I've been down that road, man. I'm not going to buy that purse. I can't afford it. Why would I buy it? Can't afford it. Done. No, no entertainment. No, no thought. No acknowledging of options. No options. Can't afford it. All right. There's God. God, what would you have me do? Oh, that's what you want me to do? That's what I'll do for the rest of my life. I want to honor you. All right? Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Pray with me. Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Father, Lead us not into a place where we would give ourselves into our thoughts and the temptations of our minds and our own evil desires and deliver us, Lord, from the evil one, the one who tempts us. God, help us to fight the evil desires in our hearts. Help us to claim victory and to apply the words that you scribe through your servant James to our lives today in Dallas, Texas. God, you are our perfect Father in heaven. The one who desires to give us life and not rip us off. Allow us to walk in obedience, to trust and obey all of our days. Amen. You've got no matrix, decision-making matrix. If you have no relationship with Christ, I plead with you to realize that he died for you, to give you life so that you would have something that you can trust in the worst of situations and the worst of circumstances, realizing that it's not about this life, but that we live everything in this life for the life to come. Forgive me when I'm a poor example of that. But I want to live according to that. I pray that it would bleed out of my life and out of your life and out of the porch as a ministry. But if you're here and you have a relationship with Christ, stop playing with temptation. Stop exploring your options for the rest of your life. You have one option. God, what would bring you the most glory? No matter how scary it is, no matter how difficult it is, Father, no matter what lays on the other end of that decision, that's what I'll do. If I die, that's what I'll do. Because I want to glorify you in all things. Father, help me do that. That's my prayer for you guys. Hey, right now, you're welcome to stay in here. We're going to play some music and keep the lights down. And this is just going to be a place of rest and a place of prayer. And if there's something that we can pray for you about, we will be up here. There'll be an entire team up here equipped and ready. They've been trained. They've read books on um, how to pray for you and what that would look like. And apply scripture to your life and your circumstance. And if you want to hang out and just build relationships and and, um, just talk with friends and talk in your community groups or whatever that is, you can go out in the porch cafe. Uh, There'll be people hanging out there. There is a porch late night tonight. And I know that they have that information at the Welcome Center. If you want to go somewhere off campus and hang out, we, we try to provide all sorts of places just so that you guys can pursue Christ together and fellowship and build relationships. We love you guys so much. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Have a great week of worship.